Our next session will be led by a longtime friend of mine and the firm's, David Sachs, on the important topic of not running out of money, which is near and dear to everyone's heart, particularly mine. Uh, David's joining us by video. Good to see you, David. And I'm going to turn it over to him. Okay. Thanks, David. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. Um, well, I'm going to speak about surviving a downturn here. And you can see here, just think of me as a cyborg sent from the future to uh, save you from destruction. Uh, come with me if you want to live. Uh, let me first talk about how, how this situation arose. I think m most of you know at this point that we're in a downturn. Just let me go over just briefly the macroeconomics of how we got here and then talk about how you should react and what you should do about it. So if you look at this chart, what it shows is CPI, which is inflation, versus the Fed funds rate, which is basically the interest rates that the Fed sets. And you can see that the blue line and the purple line track very closely because the Fed basically raises its interest rate in reaction to inflation as a way to control inflation. And if you go to the far right end of the screen here, you can see that the red line CPI inflation basically has spiked all the way up to 8% over the past year or so, while the Fed funds rate is very, very close to zero. Um, so these two things have gotten wildly out of sync with each other, and that has created the expectation that interest rates are going to rise. And in fact, they've already risen quite a bit. If you look at the 10-year uh, T-bill rate, uh, it's already risen from about 1% uh, a couple of years ago to about 3%. And there's uh, a lot of concern on the part of markets that interest rates could continue to rise because inflation remains persistently high. And that basically has caused the stock market to correct. Basically, stocks move in the opposite direction as interest rates. This is a sort of a basic principle of economics that future earnings and future revenue are discounted to their present value based on an interest rate. And if that interest rate goes up, those future revenues and earnings are just worth a lot less today. And this will always affect growth stocks uh, the most because their earnings and revenue are in the distant future. So what you've seen over the last six months is a massive a correction or really crash in growth stocks. Um, if you look at SaaS companies, IPOs, uh, recent listing, SPACs and so on, they're down roughly 80%, even for really great companies because interest rate expectations have moved up so fast. And if you just look at the indices, the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, you won't see the level of carnage that has really occurred because the, the indices are so weighted to the large caps, many of which are value stocks and don't have their, their earnings in the distant future. They have them much more closely to today. And so therefore, they haven't been discounted as much. But for all of us, the relevant public comps are growth stocks, and they have been absolutely annihilated by the spike in interest rate expectations. You can see that here. This is a chart showing the public multiples of SaaS companies, which is what, what I invest in when I was a founder in SaaS. Um, obviously, there's other kinds of growth stocks, but this is a pretty good indicator. Uh, if you look at the lines, the line on top, this sort of um, dark green line, is the high growth SaaS companies, meaning public SaaS companies that are growing 40% or more. And then the blue line, and the sort of orange line are represents sort of the median SaaS company or the medium growth SaaS company that track very closely. And then the yellow line represents low growth companies. So what you can see here is that for the median SaaS company, the uh, typical multiple, which is measured as enterprise value divided by next 12 months revenue, or you can kind of think of it as enterprise value divided by ARR is pretty consistent. That number is now today around 5.6. Um, during the uh, last couple of years, during the pandemic, it got as high as 15. So you've seen almost a two thirds reduction in the uh, valuation multiple applied to your average public SaaS company. But if you look at the fastest growing ones, the correction has been even more steep. The number here 
today for the high growth SaaS companies, they're valued by public markets at about eight times. If you're, you know, during the pandemic, during those highs, it was valued about 35 times. So huge correction there. Now, why what, were these valuation multiples so inflated during the pandemic? Well, you had a combination of the fact that for the last 10 years, really since the financial crisis in 2008, the Fed has had a very accommodative interest rate policy, the so-called ZERP or zero interest rate policy. But then that really escalated over the past two years when the Fed and Congress pumped about $10 trillion uh, into the economy. And that created a gusher of liquidity and inflated the value of all assets, but especially uh, growth assets. And so what you saw here, we, we can now see and pretty clearly that the period from you know, March or April of 2020 through uh, the end of 21 was effectively an asset bubble in, uh, in growth stocks and tech companies. And the numbers that were, the multiples that we're trading at today are really in line with where we were all the way back in 2017, 2018. So when people think or say, oh, the market's gonna bounce back, well, they have bounced back. They bounced back to the valuation multiples that existed before COVID. So in other words, they've reverted to the mean, the five-year mean. And that is why for everyone who shaped their opinions, about valuations over the last several years, they might be pretty surprised to learn that actually the last couple of years were a very exceptional period. And the future is going to look much more like, say, the you know, 2017, 2008 period or what we have today. So what this means for all of us in, in private you know, company land is that becoming a unicorn just got a lot harder. Matt Turk had a good tweet about this. So to put the depth of the reset in context, to justify a $1 billion valuation, a cloud unicorn today would need to plan on doing $178 million in revenue in the next 12 months. That's if you apply the current median cloud software multiple that we were just talking about, that 5.6 times forward revenue. So you think about how hard that is to get to $178 million in revenue and how many SaaS companies actually do that. And all that does is justify a single digit $1 billion unicorn valuation. And so Jason Lemkin has weighed in saying, if nothing else, expect a fraction of the new SaaS unicorns we saw in 2021. With so many amazing public SaaS companies now worth just two billion, you just really, really gotta be epic to be worth even a billion. So just keep that in mind. Now, you know, one thing to note is that 5.6 times forward revenue assumes the average growth rate of 20%. So if you do have a faster growth rate, you can justify a somewhat higher valuation. But just remember, the fastest growing SaaS companies, the ones that were 40% or more, only have an eight times forward revenue multiple. So it's not like you can justify the days of 35 times like we saw just last year. You know, how does all of this trickle down into private markets? So, you know, one, one way is that uh, VCs take their cues from the public comps. But in addition to that, you've just had a ton of liquidity leave the ecosystem. Over the past couple of years, what you may have seen is that we had these massive crossover funds, Tiger, KOTU, D1, and so on, come into the ecosystem. And they were really attracted to uh, private companies because they could see an arbitrage between where public valuations were and where the last uh, private rounds were. And so they essentially tried to arb out that difference by coming into growth rounds and they bid up the price of growth rounds in order to then make a profit when they IPO'd or spac or basically had a public listing of some kind. Now that the public uh, comps have come way down, a lot of that market, that, that money has left the ecosystem. There's no longer an arb there. And you can see, you know, one of the things you'll hear is, well, wasn't a lot of money raised before this, this crash. And indeed it was, but a lot of that money has already been deployed. If you just look at, for example, Tiger's last uh, venture fund. So forget about its hedge fund, this is venture fund. It raised a massive 12.7 billion in capital commitments in just March this year. But even that fund, this is based on an article that came out in TechCrunch a couple of weeks ago. Even that fund is almost fully invested already. So the thing to, and, and there's not gonna be another one, at least not, not anytime soon. So you've got to realize that huge amounts of growth capital that came into the system 
have that that money has already left the system. And then, you know, one of the things you'll hear is, well, this doesn't affect early stage C, Series A, it's still well funded. Well, but it's got to affect early stage too, because in the same way that growth investors saw their exit to the public markets, early stage investors, in a way, see an exit or at least to a markup to growth investors. And if growth investors are paying a lot less and there's less growth capital, then surely Series A and seed valuations have to come down. And the, the early stage markets are in the process of correcting too. Just in Q1, well, you saw already a VC funding drop of 20% in Q1. Uh, and then in global early stage, you saw the number of deals uh, go down in Q1 as well. And Q1 really was just the beginning of the correction in the market. Uh, April and May have been far worse than January, February, March. So you, you should expect this trend to continue very seriously into Q2. In fact, Q2 will be, I think, significantly worse. Many for, uh, VC firms are just frozen while they're awaiting clarity on where the public markets are going to bottom out. There's also significant geopolitical risk right now. We've got a war going on in Eastern Europe that could potentially spin out of control. And there's also a lot of concerns now about the possibility of a recession coming in the second half of the year, which nobody really thought at the beginning of the year that a recession was on the horizon. So there's a lot of uncertainty right now, a lot of liquid, which is causing a lot of firms to slow way down. Uh, a lot of late stage liquidity has just left the ecosystem altogether. So you should expect Q2 to be significantly worse. You know, how should you think about what the next couple of years are going to look like? Um, you know, it's hard to know exactly. So I think the right way to look at the future is in terms of scenarios. And I think there could be, you know, roughly three scenarios here. Uh, one would be like a quick, but uh, a sharp, but quick downturn, which say lasts six months. This would be kind of similar to what we had in Q1, Q2 of 2020 with the COVID crash. The market kind of quickly uh, bounced back. I personally don't believe that's where we're headed, but there are smart people who do think that. I've seen Jason Lemkin tweet that he thinks that things will be normalized by the end of the year. That doesn't mean back to the old valuation levels, but the markets will be unfrozen and sort of normalized uh, in about six months. Second possibility would be more of a standard type of recession, um, uh, you know, a la 2008, 2009. Uh, that was basically an 18 month period where valuations were down, the VC markets were semi frozen, again, taking their cues from what was happening in the public markets. Um, you know, and, and the typical recession takes about 18 months to get out of. So that would be sort of more of like an average scenario. And then the third possibility would be something like, you know, call it a nuclear winter, a la the dot com crash back in 2000. And it really went on all the way to 2003. That was about four years of a very, very tough fundraising environment. Uh, I don't think we're going to see something quite like that, but, you know, we could be in for a two year uh, plus nuclear winter. So, how should you think about this? Just rough math, apply one third, one third, one third possibilities to these scenarios. What that means is that fundraising is going to be extremely difficult to obtain um, over, well, let's say a two thirds chance over the next uh, 18 months. So, you know, you don't want to bet your company on there being this like quick, sharp recovery scenario of only six months. Um, if you do that, two thirds chance that you're wrong, roughly, and uh, the comp your company could die because you have just macroeconomic conditions. So while we can't predict the future exactly, you should kind of understand what the range of scenarios are and try to protect yourself. I would say at least against downturn and recession, nuclear winters, you know, a, a two-year plus nuclear winter is hard to protect yourself against, but you at least want to survive in the next, um, I'd say six months to two years. We've seen this movie before. I mean, if you talk to folks like who've been around for 20 years, Dave Wyden, Vinod, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a number of us, you know, it's uh, kind of scary to think of myself as an old timer now because I don't really see myself that way. But we've seen this movie before and we can tell you what these periods were like. Um, back in the days of the dot com crash, there was a website called Fuck Company, uh, which F Phil Kaplan had created. And every day it basically had news articles about company layoffs or companies shutting down. It was just every day there was some new company that was running out of money and dying. So, and, and that happened pretty much every day for roughly two years. 
So these periods can happen. Again, I don't think that we're going to be in for something quite that bad, but I think it's worth your while if you've never been through a down cycle. And let's face it, if you enter the business world in the last 14 years, you haven't seen one before. So you pretty much have to be in your late 30s to even have remembered the Great Recession of uh, 2007, 2008. And you got to be, you know, pushing 50 to remember the dot com crash. So it's worthwhile talking to folks who live, live through these things, and they can tell you what it was like. And the thing to understand about them is it's an escalator on the way up an elevator on the way down when conditions change, they change far quicker than people realize. And if you don't adjust your expectations to the new reality, you can be uh, caught in the uh, in, in the downturn in a way you don't want to be. Uh, let me give you a couple of frameworks where uh, I'm actually in a little Twitter debate about this. Um, the typical YC framework was to think about whether you're, you're default alive or default dead. I think it's a useful framework. I'm going to give you a different one in a second. But just to give default alive, it's due. The basic idea is that you assume your expenses remain constant. And then you assume your revenue growth continues along the same trajectory that it has for the last several months. And then you ask the question, can you become cash flow positive on the money that you have left in the bank? And so it's a pretty good way of asking, is inertia on your side or not? Um, so that's one way of looking at the world. Um, the way I would look at it or propose another standard is this concept of, are you default investable? Which means, are your metrics good enough to raise another round in the current environment? Um, I think this can be a better standard for early stage startups. I think that uh, for early stage startups, trying to be default alive is just about almost impossible. Uh, so therefore, I propose default investable because uh, I just think that default alive standard is so hard that um, you know very almost no um, no no companies would ever be able to no, very few startups would be able to figure that out. Now, I do think that default alive is highly relevant for later stage startups, especially those with low uh, growth rates. So, for example, if you're at 50 million ARR growing. 50% year over year, that's a situation where you really probably should cut your costs, sorry, uh, to uh, to basically uh, cut your costs to basically get to default alive because you probably are not uh, investable. Both frameworks have their risks. If you uh, default alive really depends on your ability to, to correctly forecast your future revenue. And if we go into a sudden recession, uh, there's a good chance your revenue is going to underperform plan. By the same token, default investable assumes that VC criteria don't change and that founders are you know, realistic about their investability. So let me explain now what I think default or just investable would look like. Um, so, and this, is, this table is really geared towards SaaS investors. You could create similar types of metrics for other companies, but in the SaaS world, I would. This is really early stage SaaS. Call it, you know, one to five million of ARR. Uh, great growth is three x year over year. Good is two and a half x. Danger zone, which is basically uninvestable, is you're growing less than one hundred percent year over year under two x. Gross margin seventy percent is great. Fifty percent good. Under twenty percent, basically fatal. Negative gross margins absolutely fatal in the current environment. You will not get funded, uh, even if your growth looks good. No one wants to fund a business selling dollars for ninety cents. Uh, net dollar retention, 140% is great, 120% is good. Uh, under 120%, uh, sorry, under 100% is uh, very dangerous. People do not want to fund a leaky bucket. Uh, CAC payback, six to 12 months is great, 12 to 18 months is good. Over two years, not good. That's very dangerous. People will not want to fund that growth. It is inefficient. And then burn multiple. If you have a burn multiple of one or less, which basically means that your net new ARR equals your burn. Uh, that, so let's say that you burn $10 million in a year, but you add 10 million of ARR, that would be a burn multiple of one. Uh, under one is great. One to one and a half is good. Over two is danger zone. That's inefficient growth. People are not going to fund that in the current environment. So just to summarize here, I think there's four states of okay. Number one, cash flow positive. Obviously, if you don't need to raise money, you don't need to worry about what's happening in the capital markets, you can weather the storm. Like I mentioned, I think there's a lot of, call it $50 million ARR companies with low growth that 
would not be investable by VCs today. However, if they make themselves cash flow positive by cutting costs, they can make the business work on a PE model. And you should seriously think about doing that. Uh, bucket number two, default alive. You're not cash flow positive today, but you can get cash flow positive with your current cash. That's a great position to be in if you can pull it off. Again, be realistic about your revenue expectations in light of the change in the macro economy. Then there's default investable, which means that you are cash flow negative, but VCs are going to be willing to finance your growth because you have superb metrics like the ones I just mentioned on the previous page. You kind of got to have maybe three or four great ones, maybe one or two good ones, no danger zone. That's why I would consider it superb. And then number four is the lean startup model. You have low burn, a long runway, you're iterating to product market fit, or you're iterating to fix your metrics so that you can become in category one, two, or three. If you're not on one of these four models, you're in a no man's land. You will not get funded and you'll run out of money and die. So you need to figure out which of these four models are, uh, apply to you and um, take corrections to right size accordingly. You know, agent, you have agency as a founder. There are things you can do. First of all, you want to, if you can, um, top up if po possible, be open to lower valuations, mm -hmm. adjust now uh, to, to ensure, you know, we like to recommend 30 months of runway. That's two and a half years. The reason for this is because you need time to make changes to your business. Even two years of runway sounds like a lot, but you got to remember that you can't, uh, you, you don't have all that runway because you need to fundraise six to nine months before your cash out date. So two years of runway really is only five or six quarters to make real changes in your business. So two and a half years is a lot more comfortable. That gives you eight quarters. Um, easiest places to cut, freeze your hiring, cut your burn. Remember, you have total control over your burn as a founder. It's one of the few things you have total control over. Do not act like a victim. It's something you can change. And then sales and marketing spending, you got to be real careful about that. Um, I would not spend any money on uh, marketing unless it has near-term measurable ROI. You should aim for a burn multiple of under two. Again, that means that um, you're not spending more than twice the amount of net new ARR that you're adding. Um, even a burn multiple of two in this environment is definitely risky. And the sooner you act, the more time you're going to have on the other side of those changes. So don't dither. Common mistakes, some of the things you hear, wishful thinking or denial, hey, the market's going to bounce back. I don't think so. I mean, we're looking at fundamental changes here in the, uh, in the economy. Interest rates have returned. And here's the problem. They're not like, the interest rates aren't even that high. They've just returned to something more like the historical mean. That's why they're not gonna bounce back is, you know, we're not gonna get zero interest rates again, most likely. So, you know, these changes here are here to stay. Second, you'll hear some form of dithering, we'll take action in six months. Usually this is preceded by an if then statement. If the following happens, or if the following doesn't happen, then we'll act in six months. I think that's a mistake because you'll lose that extra time that the, that six months of high burn would have gotten you if you had made the change sooner. Third, you hear a lot of squeamishness. We'll cut 10%, you know, that's a rounding error, right? If you believe that the right thing to do is to cut, you really need to look at this from first principles and figure out what your burn should be based on the principles I've laid out before, before based on your burn multiple. 10% is very unlikely to be the exact right number. So don't be squeamish. If you're going to cut, you don't want to have to cut twice. So figure out what it should be. And remember, and, you know, I've been in this situation before as an operator. It's not fun, but if you cut a little too much, you can always hire back um, if, if the circumstances permit it. But if you don't cut enough, having to do a second cut later is absolutely miserable. So uh, try to figure this out and do it once. Um, fourth objection you'll hear, sunk cost fallacy, cutting now would be too disruptive. Again, you got to think about your business in terms of first principles. How you got to your current state is kind of irrelevant. Uh, we were all gaslit by the Fed, basically, and, and zero industry policies for years. New environment is different. The sooner you adapt, the better off you're going to be. And then, you know, one of the things that's going around a lot on Twitter is this some sort of blame game. I've seen many versions of this tweet. Well, you know, UVC should have been more disciplined in the way you invested if you wanted us to be more disciplined in the way we operate. Well, guys, we're all on the same team here. You know, we don't want you going bankrupt. Um, it's kind of irrelevant 
what VCs did. We, what you should care about uh, is, you know, operating in a way that allows you to survive. You know, you're not doing, you're not making any of these changes, hopefully to make your VCs happy. You should be wanting to make changes to ensure that your business survives. Here's the good news. I don't want to end on and it's a completely pessimistic note. Some of the most iconic companies were founded in recessions. Google, Amazon, Salesforce, Airbnb, Stripe, PayPal, all these companies uh, uh, survived and thrived during major recessions. I was uh, part of PayPal. I was the COO during the dot-com crash. And uh, it was a scary time to go through. It, there's no way that what we experienced over the next couple of years will be anything close to how bad that was. And through a lot of determination and a um, a ruthless um, a ruthlessness in pursuing what was right for the company and getting to ground truth as quickly as possible and not being captive to sunk costs, we were able to make the necessary changes and survive and prosper during the uh, dot com crash. And PayPal today is a roughly hundred billion dollar company. So it is very much possible to survive and thrive during these downturns. The truth is that everything gets easier down during a downturn except one thing, which is fundraising. The war for talent, which is most startups problem is that you just can't recruit great people. That problem gets much, much easier during a downturn. Uh, another problem that you'll commonly see is you'll see like a million competitors getting funded. That stops happening during a downturn. You want as many sort of ankle biters trying to take part of your market share. So for category leading companies, Building during a downturn can be a really extraordinary opportunity. Uh, you just need to focus on fundamentals. Uh, you know, all of your VCs are here to help. Uh, the world will keep spinning. So that's the good news. Why don't I stop there? And if you have time, I'm happy to take any questions. Time for a question or two, but we need to get the microphones to people. Go ahead. David, thanks for joining us. A uh, huge fan of the All In podcast, so I wish you'd be in your in-person, but love you over Zoom. Um, wanted to ask you, for um, for companies that might be affected sort of at a meta level or maybe second order effects, like uh, let's say that you primarily serve other early stage startups, um, you know, may or maybe something in, in crypto or sort of public, you know, public market investing, you know, how, how should we think about those sort of second order effects, you know, just ramp it even harder on trying to get to, I don't know, 48 months of, of, of runway or, or what? Well, so you're talking about companies that serve some of these markets that have been most hit, like crypto or, or companies selling to other startups? Yeah, just sort of thinking about your slide of like everything other than fundraising gets easier. Um, but then in, in, at some, when we look at like the macro level, you know, we think, uh oh, like sort of we might have sort of headwinds even in our revenue or top line growth. So then how should we think about our cash con conservation? Yeah, I mean, you, you need to start modeling that out. So there's a couple of different ways that this is, can play out. So first of all, if you have SMB customers and really startup customers, there's going to be a higher mortality rate of those companies. So during the good times, during this boom, it was really easy to raise money. And as a result, you had an elevated graduation rate from C to Series A, from Series A to Series B, and so on. Not as many companies went out of business. Well, now, there's gonna be a lot more companies that can't raise that money. And in fact, so we're gonna to return to more of a historically normal graduation rate. But on top of that, there's gonna be a lot of companies who got funded, who frankly shouldn't have gotten funded. And so there may be, you can kind of think of it as like a deferred mortality risk, where all of a sudden in the next couple of years, a lot of the mortality that got deferred because of this boom will now be realized. So if you sell into those types of customers, you should just be prepared for that and you should model that possibility and you should be extra cash conscious. So the, you know, the example of this during the dot-com uh, crash was Yahoo. Yahoo sold a lot of banner advertising to startups. And initially when the crash happened, Yahoo was considered a high quality name. And so it didn't correct as much because you know, Yahoo was profitable. It wasn't you know, one of these money losing dot-coms. But then everyone realized, wait a second, all of their customers are money losing dot coms and they're going away. So you have to be careful about that. Um, you know, the other thing that can happen is even if your customers are enterprises or mid market, they're, they're not, you know, uh, likely to go out of business or something like that, they may become more cost conscious. For example, you saw that memo by Dara uh, that got a lot of press a couple of weeks ago where he came back from 
meetings on Wall Street, and he said, listen, everything's different now. We're not going to get judged based on um, growth. We're going to get judged based on free cash flow. We have to sharpen our pencils and take out every you know, piece of cost in this business that we don't need. So you should expect even enterprises are now going to get more cost conscious, and that could lengthen your sales cycles and uh, depress your close rates. So yeah, I mean, I would start modeling in the possibility for basically downturn or recession in the second half of this year. Um, if you can hit the projections you made at the beginning of the year, that'd be fantastic. But everyone's going to be under a, lot, under a lot of pressure, I think, in the second half of the year. And the thing to be careful of is not to try and overcompensate for those risks by burning a lot more money. Sometimes you'll see founders do that where they're worried about hitting their revenue goal for the year, whatever that was, a 3x or something. And they're coming in under that. And so they start overspending on marketing or sales as a way to compensate for that. Do not do that in this environment. You're better off conserving your cash and weathering the storm than trying to artificially inflate your numbers in a way that is not cost effective. Because in the current environment, investors will see through uh, sort of ir irrational growth, growth that is not, does not have good unit economics. OK. Uh, I want to thank David for helping me seem a little less relatively curmudgeonly, <laughs> which is a feat. Uh, so thank you very much, David, for joining us. Uh, we, we have more questions, but we're going to keep going. Then we'll let you go back to the rest of your day. Uh, for those of you that meet these metrics, David does have money and is interested to invest in the worthy companies. But thank you very much, David. All right. Thanks, guys. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. Thank you.